This concept or idea that you're just born because of God's decree in some condition where you only can deem the cross as foolish, God just decreed for you to be incapable, that's just foreign to what Paul is teaching. John Calvin wrote the following, All we have attempted has been to renew the ancient form of the church. If this is true, then we'd expect one popular doctrine among Protestants to be found among the church fathers, or really any prominent Christian before the Reformation in the 16th century. In this video, I'm looking for the Calvinist doctrine of total depravity in the apostolic fathers. But before I begin, what is the doctrine and why do some oppose it? Also, if you don't mind, please click that like button right now and subscribe to my channel so that more people will see this content. Total depravity is a, quote, Protestant doctrine that states that all people are born into a fallen state and are incapable of choosing to follow God without God's grace. Help me help you. It is also known as radical corruption or pervasive depravity. I didn't realize us Calvinists were so radical. The doctrine of total depravity is based on the idea of original sin and the belief that the fall affected every part of a person. It states that all people are born with a corrupt nature and are unable to do anything to save themselves. Hit me. You can't. Reach me with that hand. Reach me with that hand. You cannot. People are inclined toward evil and are enslaved to sin. It's the guy! It sucks! And I'm addicted! But I can't quit! People are unable to return to God without God's grace. People are blind, self-centered, self-impressed. Oh, so dark. People's affections are impure and they delight in evil. All right, look, just before you get too upset. That's just foreign to what Paul is teaching. It's not me who's saying this about you. Oh. It's your own Bible. You all know this, right? Honestly, if you've ever read the Bible before, it doesn't have the nicest things to say about the human heart, apart from God's changing it. Help me help you. It's kind of the reason God had to send his son to die a sacrificial death on the cross. And I mean, what's so controversial? Doesn't the Bible and just simple observations say we're all born sinners with statements like all have sinned? and fallen short of the glory of God? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Truly, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live and after they go to the dead. And then there's this gem. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I could go on. But regardless, sounds pretty bad, right? No. Again, what's the issue? Well, Total depravity, as modern Calvinists mean it, builds upon the historical idea of original sin championed by those like Augustine when he said, Only the Redeemer, whose blood wipes away our transgressions, sets people free from this illness, from this anger of God. Even if they do not have personal sin because of their age, those who carry with them original sin are by nature children of his anger, who will be so bold as to say that Christ is not the Savior and Redeemer of infants? Here you can see a great snapshot of original sin. We literally inherit it as infants. And before we get back to total depravity, isn't this scriptural? Even King David explains, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And so, if it's in the Bible, wouldn't it be in the fathers as well? Or really any prominent Christian before the Reformation in the 16th century. Again, these were the disciples of apostles. If this is true, then we'd expect one popular doctrine among Protestants to be found among the church fathers. Well, 
It is. First, let's look at how the fathers continue the biblical and apostolic tradition that all men are sinful, a fate that no one can escape. Take a look at Clement's view of himself in 2 Clement 18. Therefore, let us too be among those who give thanks, that is, those who have served God and not among the ungodly who are judged. For I myself am utterly sinful, and have not yet escaped from temptation. One of the problems many Christians have with the idea of total depravity is that they say it paints people in the worst light possible. And while that may be true, I'm sure we're all of the same mindset that we need to be most concerned with what's true and not with what we want to be true even if it isn't. Regardless, how did the spiritual authorities who wrote the Bible view the human condition? Well, according to Moses, David, and Paul, not so good. In fact, it was Clement's mentor Paul who himself said, I am convinced that nothing good, nothing good (laughs) dwells in me. And Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That the fathers and the biblical authors, for that matter, see us all as sinners is not up for debate. In the words of Polycarp, we are all in debt with respect to sin. And certainly Paul's disciple Clement pushes the discussion further when he says, for I myself am utterly sinful. Can we take from that the idea of utter or total depravity? That's what the language seems to suggest in my opinion. And what about this quote about Jesus' holy apostles from Barnabas? And when he chose his own apostles who were destined to preach his gospel, who were sinful beyond all measure in order that he might demonstrate that he did not come to call the righteous, but sinners, then he revealed himself to be God's son. At this point, I'm noticing a pattern. People suck. Like, apart from God, there really isn't anything good in us. And that's not to say that people can't do good things. It's just to say that even good things done with the wrong heart are utterly sinful, wretched, and worthless. Filthy rags, rubbish, or trash, to use biblical terminology. Now, why do some have a problem with this? Well, according to some, what people like this try to say is that Calvinism's total depravity builds on Augustine's concept of original sin with an excessively negative view of God's image in people. But is this what Calvinists mean? Here's what Calvin himself said. I now speak of the corruption of nature. The whole man from head to foot, so to speak, is so deluged as if with a great flood that no part is free from sin, because everything that proceeds from him is imputed as sin. Hence, Augustine did not hesitate to call concupiscence, that's sinful desires, sin, that is from book two of his Institutes. What's really at the heart of total depravity? Isn't it just the idea that the whole of the person is affected, the whole of the person is sinful, and honestly, isn't that what the Bible teaches? Calvin adds, yet so depraved is his nature that He can be moved only to evil. Man is surely subject to the necessity of sinning. And that is the key there. Through freedom, man came to be in sin, but the corruption which followed as punishment turned freedom into necessity. In this statement, we can see very clearly the implications of original sin as Augustine described it, meaning that it is impossible for people to make truly moral decisions. Reach me with that. You cannot. For the right reason, meaning to bring glory to God. What other reason is there? You see, what many people prefer to total depravity is total inability or the inability of someone to choose God without God's help, you know, through a new nature, one free from original sin. This is what Calvin means in his Institutes when he says, the human will does not obtain grace by freedom, but obtains freedom 
by grace. The direction of the human will toward good and its continuation in good depend solely upon God's will, not upon any merit in man. And whatever it can do, it is able to do only through grace. This makes a lot of sense to me, and I think to anyone out there who would admit to being a lost, putrefying sinner, desperately in need of God's grace, because I think at the end of the day, who is going to say that you did this of your own volition? Certainly, it was God who did the transformative work, who prepared the way for you to come to know him. Finally, the canons of Dort, which later clarified what we call Calvinism, say it like this. Therefore, all people are conceived in sin and are born children of wrath, unfit for any saving good, inclined to evil, dead in their sins, and slaves to sin. Without the grace of the regenerating Holy Spirit, they are neither willing nor, here's the key, able to return to God. Reach me with that hand. You cannot. To reform their distorted nature or even to dispose themselves to such reform. Is any of this making sense to you? The doctrine of total depravity, therefore, isn't so much a statement that people are a piece of crap, but that we cannot choose good or God, who alone is good, apart from his regenerative work. That's all. And don't the scriptures teach this when they say things like this? The natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit, or no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, or even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive in Christ. Doesn't sound like something we can do on our own. Well, this same sentiment of total inability also appears in the apostolic fathers, who Go figure, we're reading the same Bible we are. Here's a few examples. Evil ones will seek me but not find me. Those who belong to the flesh cannot do spiritual things. Very reminiscent of Paul's words in his letter to the Corinthians. Nor can those who are spiritual do fleshly things just as faith cannot do the things of faith. This quote by Ignatius also seems to suggest perseverance of the saints, but I'll save that for another video. The Didache also seems to suggest in this statement that God's pattern is to work in us to cause conversion. For he comes to call, not with regard to reputation, but those whom the Spirit has prepared. Also, look at this statement from Barnabas, suggesting that it is impossible to bring yourself into a state of righteousness. That's justification. Who is the one who condemns me? Let him oppose me. Or who is the one who vindicates, justifies himself against me? You see, at the heart of this issue is that God must change our heart in order for us to believe. This is total depravity, total inability. We see this exact concept in the epistle to Diognetus. Having demonstrated, therefore, in the former time the powerlessness of our nature to obtain life, and having now revealed the Savior's power to save even the powerless, he willed that for both these reasons we should believe in his goodness. And Barnabas agrees. Furthermore, with respect to the ears, he describes how he circumcised our heart, a key biblical analogy here. The Lord says in the prophet, as soon as they heard, they obeyed me. And again, he says, those who are far off will hear with their ears. They shall understand what I have done. Also, circumcise your hearts, says the Lord. In short, he circumcised our hearts in order that when we hear the word, we might believe. He continues, but we, however, having rightly understood the commandments, explain them as the Lord intended. He circumcised our ears and hearts for this very purpose so that we might understand these things. Now, there is some discrepancy as to how we could interpret the word might, since in the Greek it could say would, meaning that there is more of a certainty of 
the believing on our part, but that would also fall under the category of another video on irresistible grace. In addition, the Hebrew concept of hearing the analogy that's so often likened to faith in the scriptures presupposes obedience. So one may say here that if God calls and we hear, obedience is assumed. And honestly, I think it is from a scriptural perspective. All of that to say, my point is here that God moves first. And this is the conclusion. Man cannot initiate his own salvation apart from grace. Man cannot initiate his salvation without regeneration, circumcision of the heart, because sin has affected the totality of his being with a depraved heart, mind, and soul. Like, why is this so controversial? Seriously. Liar! But if you disagree, feel free to leave a comment. I do hope this study was fruitful to create assurance for your Christian walk. It is part of a larger series on the Church Fathers in which I highlight biblical reformed theology in their writings so you can be encouraged. So again, please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And if you did, share it with a friend. And what are you waiting for? Subscribe to this channel. I'd greatly appreciate it. And until next time, friends, it was great to gospel with you. Thank you.